sweet music, his soul was all dewy wet. Over his limbs in sleep, pale cool waves of light had passed. He lay still, as if his soul lay amid cool waters, conscious of faint sweet music. His mind was waking slowly to a tremulous morning knowledge, a morning inspiration. A spirit filled him, pure as the purest water, sweet as dew, moving as music. But how faintly it was he breathed, how passionlessly, as if the seraphim themselves were breathing upon him. His soul was waking slowly, fearing to wake wholly. It was that windless hour of dawn when madness wakes and strange plants open to the light and the moth flies forth silently. An enchantment of the heart. The night had been enchanted. In a dream or vision he had known the ecstasy of seraphic life. Was it an instant of enchantment only, or long hours and days and years and ages? The instant of inspiration seemed now to be reflected from all sides at once, from a multitude of cloudy circumstances of what had happened or of what might have happened. The instant flashed forth like a point of light, and now from cloud on cloud of vague circumstance, the confused form was veiling softly its afternoon. In the virgin womb of the imagination, the word was made flesh. Gabriel the seraph had come to the virgin's chamber. An afterglow deepened within his spirit, whence the white flame had passed, deepening to a rose and ardent light. That rose and ardent light was her strange, willful heart, strange that no man had known or would know, willful before the beginning of the world. Lured by that ardent rose like glow, the choirs of the seraphim fallen from heaven. Are you not weary of ardent ways? Lure of the fallen seraphim, tell no more of enchanted days. The verses passed from his mind to his lips and, murmuring them over, he felt the rhythmic movement of a villanelle pass through. The rose like glow sent forth its rays of rhyme, ways, days, blaze, rays, rays. Its rays burned up the world, consumed the hearts of men and angels, the rays from the rose that was heart. Your eyes have set man's heart ablaze, and you have had your will of heart not weary of hearted ways. And then the rhythm died away, ceased, began again to move and beat, and then smoke, incense ascending from the altar of the world. Above the flame, the smoke of praise goes up from ocean rim to rim, tell no more of enchanted days. Smoke went up from the whole earth, from the vapory oceans, smoke of her praise. The earth was like a swinging, smoking, swaying censer, a ball of incense, an ellipsoidal ball. The rhythm died out at once, the cry of his heart was broken. His lips began to murmur the first verses over and over, then went on stumbling through half-verses, stammering and baffled, then stopped. The heart's cry was broken. The veiled, windless hour had passed, and behind the panes of the naked window, the morning light was gathering. A bell beat faintly very far away. A bird twittered, two birds, three. The bell and the bird ceased, and the dull white light spread itself east and west, covering the world, covering the rose light in his heart. Fearing to lose all, he raised himself suddenly on his elbow to look for paper and pencil. There was neither on the table, only the soup plate he had eaten the rice from for supper, and the candlestick with its tendrils of tallow and its paper socket, singed by the last flame. He stretched his arm wearily towards the foot of the bed, groping with his hand in the pockets of the coat that hung there. His fingers found a pencil, and then a cigarette packet. He lay back and, tearing open the packet, placed the last cigarette on the window ledge, and began to write out the stanzas of the villanelle in small, neat letters on the rough cardboard surface. Having written them out, he lay back on the lumpy pillow, murmuring them again. 
the lumps of knotted cloth under his head reminded him of the lumps of knotted horsehair in the sofa of her parlor, on which he used to sit, smiling or serious, asking himself why he had come, displeased with her and with himself, confounded by the print of the sacred heart above the untenanted sideboard. He saw her approach him in a lull of the talk and beg him to sing one of his curious songs. Then he saw himself sitting at the old piano, striking chords softly from its freckled keys and singing amid the talk which had risen again in the room. To her who leaned beside the mantelpiece, a dainty song of the Elizabethans, a sad and sweet loft to depart, the victory chant of Agincourt, and the happy air of green sleeves. Nothing sang and she listened, or feigned to listen. His heart was at rest. When the quaint old songs had ended, and he heard again the voices, he remembered his own sarcasm. The house where young men are called by their Christian names a little too soon. At certain instants, her eyes seemed about to trust him, but he had waited in vain. She passed now, dancing lightly across his memory, as she had been that night at the carnival ball, her white dress a little lifted, a white spray nodding in her she danced lightly in the round. She was dancing towards him, and as she came, her eyes were a little averted, and a faint glow was on her cheek. At the pause of the chain of hands, her hand had lain in his hands, and soft merchandise. You are a great stranger now. Yes, I was born to be a monk. I am afraid you are a heretic. Are you much afraid? For answer, she had danced away from him along the chain of hands, dancing lightly and discreetly, giving herself to glow. The white spray nodded to her dancing, and when she was in shadow, the glow was deeper on her cheek. A monk. His own image started forth, a profaner of the cloister, a heretic Franciscan, willing and willing not to serve, spinning like Girardino da Borgo San Nino, a lithe web of sophistry and whispering. No, it was not his image. It was like the image of the young priest in whose company he had seen her last, looking at him out of Dove's eyes, toying with the pages of her Irish phrase book. Yes, yes, the ladies are coming round to us. I can see it every day. The ladies are with us, the best helpers the language has. And the church, Father Moran? The church, too. Coming round, too. The work is going ahead there, too. Don't fret about the church. Bah! done well to leave the room in disdain. He had done well not to salute her on the steps of the library. He had done well to leave her to flirt with her priest, to toy with a church which was the scullery maid of Christendom. Rude, brutal anger routed the last lingering instant of ecstasy from his soul. It broke up violently her fair image and flung the fragments on all sides. On all sides, distorted reflections of her image started from his memory. The flower girl in the ragged dress with damp, coarse hair on a hoyden's face, who had called herself his own girl and begged his hansel. The kitchen girl in the next house who sang over the clatter of her plates with the drawl of a country singer, the first bars of By Killarney's Lakes and Fells. A girl who had laughed gaily to see him stumble when the iron grating in the footpath near Cork Hill had caught the broken sole of his shoe. A girl he had glanced at, attracted by her small ripe mouth as she passed out of Jacob's biscuit factory, who had cried to him over her shoulder, Do you like what you've seen of me, straight hair and curly eyebrows? And yet he felt that, however he might revile and mock her image, his anger was also a form of homage. He had left the classroom in disdain that was not wholly sincere, feeling that perhaps the secret of her race lay behind those dark eyes upon which her long lashes flung a quick shadow. He had told himself bitterly as he walked through the streets that she was a figure of the womanhood of her country, a bat-like soul waking to the consciousness of itself in darkness and secrecy and loneliness, tarrying a while, loveless and sinless, with her mild lover and leaving him to whisper of innocent transgressions in the latticed ear of a priest. His anger against her found vent in coarse railing at her paramour, whose name and voice and features offended his baffled pride. A priested peasant, with a brother a policeman in Dublin, and a brother a potboy in Moycullen. To 
him she would unveil her soul's shy nakedness to one who was but schooled in the discharging of a formal rite, rather than to him, a priest of eternal imagination, transmuting the daily bread of experience into the radiant body of ever-living life. The radiant image of the Eucharist united again in an instant his bitter and despairing thoughts, their cries arising unbroken in a hymn of thanksgiving. Our broken cries and mournful lays rise in one Eucharistic hymn, are you not weary of ardent ways? While sacrificing hands upraise the chalice flowing to the brim, tell no more of enchanted days. He spoke the verses aloud from the first lines till the music and rhythm suffused his mind, turning it to quiet indulgence, then copied them painfully to feel them the better by seeing them, then lay back on his bolster. The full morning light had come, no sound was to be heard, but he knew that all around him life was about to awaken in common noises, hoarse voices, sleepy prayers. Shrinking from that light, he turned towards the wall, making a cowl of the blanket and staring at the great overblown scarlet flowers of the tattered wallpaper. He tried to warm his perishing joy in their scarlet glow, imagining a roseway from where he lay upwards to heaven all strewn with scarlet flowers. Weary, weary, he too was weary of ardent ways. A gradual warmth, a languorous weariness passed over him, descending along his spine from his closely cowled head. He felt it descend and, seeing himself as he lay, smiled. Soon he would sleep. He had written verses for her again after ten years. Ten years before she had worn her shawl cowl-wise about her head, sending sprays of her warm breath into the night air, tapping her foot upon the glassy road. It was the last tram. The lank brown horses knew it and shook their bells to the clear night in admonition. The conductor talked with the driver, both nodding often in the green light of the lamp. They stood on the steps of the tram, he on the upper, she on the lower. She came up to his step many times between their phrases and went down again and once or twice remained beside him, forgetting to go down, and then went down. Let be. Let be. Ten years from that wisdom of children to his folly. If he sent her the verses, they would be read out at breakfast amid the tapping of eggshells. Folly indeed. The brothers would laugh and try to wrest the page from each other with their strong, hard fingers. The suave priest, her uncle, seated in his armchair, would hold the page at arm's length, read it smiling, and approve of the literary form. No, no, that was folly. Even if he sent her the verses, she would not show them to others. No, no, she could not. He began to feel that he had wronged her. A sense of her innocence moved him almost to pity her an innocence he had never understood till he had come to the knowledge of it through sin, an innocence which she too had not understood while she was innocent or before the strange humiliation of her nature had first come upon her. Then first her soul had begun to live as his soul had when he had first sinned, and a tender compassion filled his heart as he remembered her frail pallor and her eyes, humbled and saddened by the dark shame while his soul had passed from ecstasy to languor, where had she been? Might it be, in the mysterious ways of spiritual life, that her soul at those same moments had been conscious of his homage? It might be. A glow of desire kindled again his soul, and fired and fulfilled all his body. Conscious of his desire, she was waking from odorous sleep, the temptress of his villanelle. Her eyes, dark and with a look of languor, were opening to his eyes. Her nakedness yielded to him, radiant, warm, odorous and lavish-limbed, enfolded him like a shining cloud, enfolded him like water with a liquid light. And like a cloud of vapor, or like waters circumfluent in space, the liquid letters of speech, symbols of the element of mystery, flowed forth over his brain. Are you not weary of ardent ways, lure of the fallen seraphim? Tell no more of enchanted days. Your eyes have set man's heart ablaze, and you have had your will of him. Are you not weary of ardent ways? Above the flame the smoke of praise goes up from ocean rim to rim. Tell no more of enchanted days.
enchanted days. Our broken cries and mournful lays rise in one Eucharistic hymn. Are you not weary of ardent rays? While sacrificing hands upraise the chalice flowing to the brim, tell no more of enchanted days. And still you hold our longing gaze with languorous look and lavish limb. Are you not weary of ardent ways? Tell no more of enchanted days. What birds were they? He stood on the steps of the library to look at them, leaning wearily on his ash plant. They flew round and round the jutting shoulder of a house in Woolsworth Street. The air of the late March evening made clear their flight, their dark, darting, quivering bodies flying clearly against the sky as against a limp-hung cloth of smoky, tenuous blue. He watched their flight, bird after bird, a dark flash, a swerve, a flash again, a dart aside, a curve, a flutter of wings. He tried to count them before all their darting, quivering bodies passed, six, ten, eleven, and wondered were they odd or even in number. 12, 13, for two came wheeling down from the upper sky. They were flying high and low, but ever round and round in straight and curving lines, and ever flying from left to right, circling about a temple of air. He listened to the cries, like the squeak of mice behind the wainscot, a shrill two-fold note. But the notes were long and shrill and whirring, unlike the cry of vermin, falling a third or a fourth and trilled as the flying beaks cloaked the air. Their cry was shrill and clear and fine and falling like threads of silken light unwound from purring spools. The inhuman clamor soothed his ears in which his mother's sobs and reproaches murmured insistently and the dark, frail, quivering bodies wheeling and fluttering and swerving round an airy temple of the tenuous sky soothed his eyes which still saw the image of his mother's face. Why was he gazing upwards from the steps of the porch, hearing their shrill twofold cry, watching their flight? For an augury of good or evil? A phrase of Cornelius Agrippa flew through his mind, and then there flew hither and thither shapeless thoughts from Swedenborg on the correspondence of birds to things of the intellect, and of how the creatures of the air have their knowledge and know their times and seasons, because they, unlike man, are in the order of their life and have not perverted that order by reason, and for ages men had gazed upward as he was gazing at birds in flight. The colonnade above him made him think vaguely of an ancient temple and the ash plant on which he leaned wearily of the curved stick of an auger. A sense of fear of the unknown moved in the heart of his weariness, a fear of symbols and portents, of the hawk-like man whose name he bore, soaring out of his captivity on osier wooden wings, of thought god of writers, writing with a reed upon a tablet and bearing on his narrow ibis head the cusped moon. He smiled as he thought of the god's image, for it made him think of a bottle-nosed judge in a wig, putting commas into a document which he held at arm's length, and he knew that he would not have remembered the god's name, but that it was like an Irish oath. It was folly. But was it for this folly that he was about to leave forever the house of prayer and prudence into which he had been born, and the order of life out of which he had come? They came back with shrill cries over the jutting shoulder of the house, flying darkly against the fading air. What birds were they? He thought that they must be swallows who had come back from the south. Then he was to go away, for they were birds ever going and coming, building ever an unlasting home under the eaves of men's houses, and ever leaving the homes they had built to wander. Bend down your faces, Una and Aleel. I gaze upon them as the swallow gazes upon the nest under the eave before he wander the loud waters. <laughs>